Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, we spent some time in Cornwall in the United Kingdom uh, at the Eden Project. So the Eden Project is an absolutely beautiful spot uh, for education. It is the site of the world's largest indoor rainforest. And last week, we connected with Tom and Robbie, and they took us into the world of plant adaptations. So I'm going to bring them in with us again right now. Hey, Tom. Hey, Robbie. How are we doing? Hi, Joe. Great. Thank you. Hey, Joe. All good. Good stuff. Well, it's great to see you both. Uh, we're excited to explore a little bit more. And I think today we're going to touch a little bit on, on climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thanks for having us. Uh, so yeah, I am Robbie and this is Tom and we are live from Eden Project's Rainforest Biome here in Cornwall. Um, the plan is that we are going to just tell you a quick bit about Eden Project in case you, you, you've you never heard of Eden, just so you know where we're coming from. And then we're gonna think a little bit about the relationship between tropical rainforests and climate change. So I'm gonna hand over to Tom for a moment, who's gonna be able to give you a little bit of that Eden background. Okay. Thanks very much, Robbie. So the picture you can see on the screen in front of you now, everybody, is the picture of the Eden Project site. Um, the building at the front at the moment, this is the education centre. This is where I am currently sitting. And the one at the back, this strange bubble shaped biome, um, is the rainforest where Robbie is coming to you from live today. So as he said, for those of you who haven't heard of the Eden Project before or haven't been lucky enough to be here, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to our project and the background. So about 20 25 years ago, um, a man called Tim Smith had the idea of turning this large sandy hole in the ground that you can see in the picture in front of you now into a living theatre for plants and people. He had the idea of using this place to display tropical plants and plants from all over the world for people from all over the world to come and visit. And uh, these are some pictures of our site as the development took place. So you can see in this one here, um, we had to create 85,000 tonnes of soil and we've used that to fill the pit and to enable us to start growing all sorts of plants, some of which we will show you today. And this is pretty much the Eden Project as it looks today. Now we have a mission here at Eden. Everyone who visits us or who we get who we're lucky enough to talk to online, we want to talk to them about the importance of connecting people with nature. Because quite often it's easy to think about nature as being something that's outside somewhere and something that we're apart from. Whereas here at Eden, we want everyone to know you are part of nature. And now is a really important time in the history of our planet to start working together and supporting all living things and in particular plants because after all we are home to two of the biggest greenhouses in the world and that really is going to be the focus of what we talk about uh, today. Right then so here's a quick bird's eye view as I said earlier on Robbie is currently coming to you guys from our rainforest biome which is the largest indoor rainforest in the world so it's over 55 meters high 200 meters wide and there it is chock-a-block full of tropical plants there are over a thousand different species of tropical plants in our rainforest um, unfortunately we won't be able to talk to you about all of them but certainly be able to let you know about some of them today um, rainforests themselves um, are some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Uh, tropical rainforests around the world are home to 170,000 plant species. And this is more than two thirds of all plant species found on Earth come from tropical rainforests. As I said, they are extremely biodiverse. 50% of all plant and animal species that are found on land are found in tropical rainforests. So they're really biodiverse and really important places. Now then, just before we hand back to Robbie, I want to show you this graphic, because this graphic does an excellent job of summing up what we're going to be talking to you about today. Today, we're going to be talking about the rainforest and the impact that it can have on the world's climate, but also the impact that the climate is currently having on the tropical rainforest. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking about a tree called the oil nut tree. I've got a picture of it here and I know that Robbie is standing fairly close to the oil nut tree in our rainforest biome. This is one of the tallest trees that we have in our biome. It's at over 25 metres tall. But bear in mind, scientists have found trees in the tropical rainforest that are over 100 metres tall. So that's four times the height of the one that Robbie is showing you right now. 
it's mind blowing to think how tall some of these rainforest trees can be. But as Robbie's about to tell you, they are really important in relation to climate and in the response to climate change. So with that, I'm going to hand you back over to Robbie, who's going to tell you a bit more about the oil nut tree. Over to you, Robbie. Okay, folks. Um, thank you, Tom. So, yeah, I am stood in front of our famous oil nut tree. It's one of the biggest trees we, we have here in our biome, but still in terms of rainforest trees, as Tom said, it is really only a very, still a very small tree. But it, it's a useful tree because we use it to tell stories about the connection between plants and the rainforest and climate and the role that forests play in climate change. So we like to think of trees, not just as trees, but I mean, trees and forests do so many useful things for us in, in our environment. One of the things they do is they catch carbon. So we like to think of trees like this one as a carbon catcher, okay, a carbon catcher. Plants like this absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as they grow. Now, as I'm sure you guys are aware, um, climate change is linked to, to uh, having too much greenhouse gases in our atmosphere and carbon dioxide is one of those greenhouse gases. So trees and plants and any green plant actually absorbs this gas out of the atmosphere. So how do they do this? Well, it's all about that thing which I expect you've heard of before called photosynthesis. So the leaves of the plant are super important and I'm not going to climb to the top of our old nut tree to find you a leaf because I'll probably fall out. What I'm going to do is just find a leaf much closer to home and we'll use this leaf as our example. So within these leaves, they are underneath the underside of the leaf. There are microscopic holes called stomata. Now, I can't show you with this camera because we need a microscope. But underneath the leaf, there are macroscopic holes and through those holes, gases can be exchanged with the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide gas enters the leaves and then inside the leaves that is combined with water uh, in the presence of sunlight and through that process, through that combination, through that photosynthesis process, the plant then produces sugars. Now the plant can choose what to do with those sugars. Some of the sugar it's going to use in respiration to release energy so that the plant can do the things the plant needs to do. But also some of those sugars are going to be converted into solid carbon compounds which are used to build the tree. So when you look at a tree, here's a tree in front of me here, or if I look back at our oil nut tree, broadly speaking, you could say that 50% of the biomass, the dry mass of that tree is carbon. So it's a massive store of carbon. So these trees, they are carbon catchers and they are also carbon storers. And big trees have the capacity to store an awful lot of carbon. And that has a big impact when we're thinking about addressing climate change. Now, just, just as a, to give you a kind of sense of that, um, here in the UK, we've got an organization called the National Trust. Uh, one of the statistics that they've recently published is that sort of a good rule of thumb is that a tree can remove one ton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere over its lifetime. Now, the average person in the UK emits about nine tons um, of carbon dioxide throughout the year. OK, so you would need to plant nine of those trees and grow them for the rest of that tree's life to absorb your carbon footprint from one year. OK, Tom, now, is there something else we were going to mention about um, the relationship these plants, these trees and the rainforest also have with with a fungus whilst I make my way to the top of our platform? Absolutely. Thank you, Robbie. Um, so, yeah, indeed, lots of the trees in the rainforest are connected by a specific type of fungus, which is called mycorrhizal fungi. Now, this mycorrhizal fungi grows under the ground. And what it does is it connects the root systems of these trees through the soil. Now, this fungi receives carbon, uh, usually in the form of sugars from the trees. So through that process of photosynthesis that Robbie was talking about a moment ago, some of those sugars are sent down into the ground, sent into the soil and given to uh, to the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, but they also they store carbon as well. So the fungi passes nutrients from the ground up to the tree and in return it stores some of the carbon that the tree has sequestered from the atmosphere into the soil. 
Um, and this is known as symbiosis or a symbiotic relationship. And this is a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. So where the tree benefits because it's sending some of its carbon down into the ground, but also where the fungi benefits as well because it's a uh, uh, and sorry, the tree benefits because it's also receiving nutrients, but the uh, the fungi also helps because it's storing carbon. So a type of symbiotic relationship. Now, I can see that Robbie is rapidly making his way to the top of the oil nut tree. Um, he's gone a little bit fuzzy at the moment, so hopefully we'll see him properly in just a moment. Uh, but when he gets to the top, he's going to tell you a little bit more about the relationship between large rainforest trees like this one and the climate. So I think we've got you back. Robbie, are you still there? Are you able to hear us? You might be on mute at the moment, Robbie. Oh, it looks like we've lost him for a moment, guys. So we're going to see if we can get Robbie back. Um, but for now, you're going to you're you're stuck with me for a little bit longer, which is absolutely fine. So as I said, Robbie was making his way up to our canopy walkway, which is right at the top of our rainforest. So he started off at the bottom, uh, near the bottom of the oil nut tree, and now he's going to make his way to the top. So fingers crossed, I can see he's uh, making his way back in. I can hear him there. So hopefully, in just a second, we'll get back to Robbie. It looks as if his signal has cleared up. A little bit, which is excellent. Robbie, can you hear us now? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Tom. I had to do a mad dash on our aerial walkway, and I think as I did so, I uh, across the rope bridge and whatnot, um, I uh, I lost signal, but I'm I'm back. I don't know where we've got to though, Tom. <laughs> so, to be honest, I was just saying to everyone that we'd lost you for a second and they had to put up with me. Um, I was explaining that you were making that journey to the top of the tree, but I haven't actually got much further than that. So um, over to you now to tell us a little bit more about the relationship between these big rainforest trees and the climate as you were planning to do when you got to the top anyway. Excellent. OK, thanks, Tom. So I'm on the top of our aerial walkway and I guess in a real rainforest, in our rainforest, we're kind of at canopy level. But in a real rainforest, we, we wouldn't be at canopy level yet. We'd still be sort of understory up towards um, towards the canopy. Um, but the canopy is the principal site for gas exchange between the plants and the atmosphere. So remember, we talked about those stomata, the microscopic holes on the underside of the leaves and the gases of water vapour and the carbon dioxide and oxygen can can um, can move through those pores. Um, and so it's kind of where the, the gases make their way from the plant or into the plant from the atmosphere. Um, but there's another way that plants um, are a really important part of the story when it comes to climate change. Um, and it's through the story of the water cycle. So if I look at our oil nut tree, so we've got a big banana, those giant banana plants uh, banana leaves there, but if if, I, if you look through those, oh, if you look through the leaves, um, you can see the oil nut tree again that we were stood at the bottom of. Well, this oil nut tree is sucking up huge quantities of water from the soil, and that water is going up the up the uh, xylem vessels in the tree, and it's going into the leaves uh, at the top of the oil nut tree. Now, as it go, enters the leaves. A lot of that water, although some of it will be used in photosynthesis, some of it's also going to be used um, to keep the plant cool. Because just like people, plants effectively sweat. One of the ways the trees keep cool is that water evaporates through the leaves, through the stomata, into the atmosphere. And when it does that, it has a cooling effect on the plant. In the same way, this has a cooling effect on the atmosphere. Now, not only that, but when the water vapour enters the atmosphere, it generates massive clouds. And these clouds form above rainforests. Now, these clouds um, and, uh, actually have a reflective effect. It's called the albedo effect. And they reflect sunlight back out of the atmosphere, back out into space. So we can really think of these forests and these trees as also being water sweaters and sun reflectors. So again, helping to keep the planet cool. They're effectively acting as a, a giant air conditioning system for planet Earth. So it's super important. And I suppose the other really important thing to remember as well is that with all this warm, moist air rising above our tropical rainforests, that also creates and it drives air currents and circulation patterns and weather patterns across the, the whole regions of the globe. So they are also air movers 
and these forests are also rainmakers. So super important. And I think it's really, if we use that analogy, it's just, we want to think about the importance of rainforest and climate change, just to think of them as a giant air conditioning system is, is a really great an analogy to hold in mind. Okay. I'm going to hand back to Tom for a moment, I think. Are you there, Tom? Yeah, I'm here, Robbie. Thank you very much. So even though it's been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, we can see that rainforests really do af affect climate. So through those processes of photosynthesis and transpiration, we have seen how the rainforest is having an impact on the climate. Um, and But the opposite is also true. So as well as rainforests impacting the climate, the climate is also having an impact on rainforests. And scientists are worried about the impacts of climate change and the impacts they'll have on the rainforest. So for example, due to climate change, we're seeing um, periods of droughts, we're seeing more tropical storms um, and all sorts of other um, negative effects as well. And this can be quite a scary thought, but it's important to know that there are millions of people all around the world who are working to take action to help the climate and to protect the rainforest. And we can all join in and we can all take action too in our daily lives. Quite often it's easy to feel powerless, but actually there are all sorts of things we can do. And we've got a top tip for you here. So looking again at our rainforest graphic, the, the one that I've displayed on the screen, it's important to remember that action that we take to help look after the rainforest, ones like these, so buying careful products, avoiding certain food outlets, um, buying things that maybe have logos on them of companies that support the rainforest, like Rainforest Alliance, and having important conversations like the one we're having today, if we're taking actions to protect the rainforest, that will also have an impact on the world's climate. And in return, in reverse, anything that we do to help the climate, so for example, considering our travel plans, walking more dry, uh, rather than driving or going on aeroplanes, making sure we switch things off and saving electricity, recycling and reusing things in our everyday lives, these sorts of actions can also have a positive impact on the rainforest as well as on the climate. So it's really important to remember that we all have an important part to play in this story. And we can all do things and everything that we do matters and is really important. OK, I think I've summed that up well, Robbie. I'm going to hand back to you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, I guess the other thing that just popped into my mind is just the idea that it's really helpful and useful if we think in terms of systems and how actually, you know, imagine the rainforest as part of the carbon cycle and the rainforest is part of the water cycle. And also imagine ourselves as part of those systems as well. And everything that we do in our lives has an impact on those global systems. And when we really start to use that kind of systems thinking, we can really work together on, on the right sorts of solutions. OK, so hopefully we told you a little bit about Eden really briefly. And we've also tried to go into a little bit of detail about just why tropical rainforests are so important when it comes to the fight against climate change.